Thank you so much for coming here and joining us tonight. My name is Rindy Zhang. I'm Programs Director with the World Affairs Council. It's nice to have all of you here tonight. Our board member, uh, World Affairs Council uh, of Greater Houston, Pat Moran, who's also president of Moran Exploration LP, and also manager of Harpia Moran Publishing Joint Venture, which specializes in reports and books on Russian, Chinese, Middle East, and other air forces using uh, Russian or Chinese-derived de aircraft and air defense systems. And Pat is also a member uh, of the European Military Press Association. Now, please welcome Pat to the stage to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for all being here. Tonight, we're co-sponsoring this with the Israeli Public Diploma Diplomacy Forum, which I'll mention in a moment. Our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Etan Gilboa, is the uh, director for the Center of International Communications and Senior Research Associate at the Begin and Sadat, uh, Sadat Center at the Bar Ilan University. Um, they have a great website with a lot of interesting articles on it. So if you're interested in the Middle East, which I think we all should be, that is a great place to go. The Israeli Public Dis Diplomacy Forum is a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational organization, the purpose of which is to advance international understanding of Israel and the Middle East. Uh, it seeks to spark debate, promote dialogue, and facilitate a free and fair exchange of views on current regional affairs. Uh, back to Dr. Gilboa. Uh, he is also the uh, chair and academic director for the Israel Public Diplomacy Forum. Um, he uh, has his uh, doctorate degree and master's degree from Harvard. And he has taught at universities around the world, including the Hebrew University, Harvard, uh, Georgetown, UCLA, um, Tufts, uh, University of Hamburg, and at USC, where he is an adju uh, uh, adjunct professor or associate professor uh, in the School of Communications. Uh, <clears throat> professor Gilboa has focused not just on the substance of diplomacy and political diplomacy, uh, public diplomacy, but also on communications and how uh, the uh, public opinion uh, affects uh, diplomacy and uh, public diplomacy in the United States and around the world. Um, <clears throat> he founded the School of Communications uh, at the Center for International Communications at Bar Ilan University. And uh, he has been a senior research fellow at a number of places, RAND Corporation, the Center for International and Strategic Studies in Washington, um, the uh, uh, Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard, and the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. And without any further ado, Professor. Good evening. It's nice to, it's very nice to see so many people interested in foreign affairs. Uh, it would have been very useful if many more people in the United States as well as in Europe would be interested in foreign affairs. Perhaps we would have had a better international system. I would like to thank the World Affairs Council of Houston for, the, for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening to you about the situation in the Middle East. I'll be speaking for about you know, 30, 35 minutes, and then um, the rest of the time of the evening uh, could be used for questions and answers. If everybody will ask a question, we can stay here until 4 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and this will not happen. So this is the Middle East. Big mess. Big chaos. Um, and um, we don't know anymore who is fighting against whom, uh, for what purpose, who is creating alliances, who is breaking alliances, it all depends on the specific day of the week because events are rapidly changing all the time. And this tells you a little bit about the situation in Syria where everybody is fighting everybody else, although what leaders say they are doing is not necessarily what they 
are really doing. Everybody is fighting terrorism. Everybody says it is fighting the ISIS terrorism. But everybody has its own terrorists. So for Bashar al-Assad, those relatively uh, liberal, moderate re uh, rebels that started the uprising in Syria a few years ago, they are terrorists. For the United States and Saudi Arabia, they are freedom fighters. Uh, for Russia, everybody against Assad is a terrorist. And for Turkey, for example, the Kurds are the number one terrorists in the region. So everybody, as you can see here in this uh, cartoon, everybody's fighting everybody else. And if we look at Syria, The person drawing, the person drawing this uh, slide must have uh, drunk something. <laughs> it's very confusing. As I said earlier, very difficult to know who is, uh, who is uh, fighting whom. So these are the subjects I'll be speaking about this evening. And I hope that they, at the end of the lecture, you will a little bit better understand what is happening, why it is happening, and what the consequences uh, are or could be in the foreseeable future. So this is something that all of you have to understand. The Middle East is rich in history, religion, and culture. And if we do not know all of these three, it's very difficult to understand what is happening today. And uh, so uh, the topics that I want to talk about, Shia versus Sunni Islam, the Sykes-Picot Agreement of about 100 years ago, Arab Spring, this you know better, ISIS, Iran nuclear deal, and new alliances in the region. And I'll speak very briefly about each of those because usually at home, in my home, I teach a whole yearly course about, about those issues. So where is the Middle East? Um, might, be, might be a trivial question, right? Turns out not to be the case. Um, so this is, I hope you can see. This is a, a broad, see this? This is a broad definition of the Middle East. Um, we don't know exactly who invented the term. We suspect that it was a British official uh, in India. The first time it was used uh, in any publication you might want to learn uh, was, uh, was made by a naval American officer by the name of Alfred Mahan to 1902. And he used the term, like in a professional term, military term, in an article he published in a British journal called National Review. In any event, it's a, this is the middle of what? It's the middle between Britain and the Far East, and India, and China. So this is, this is, this is a European-centered concept imposed on the Middle East. So people in the Middle East don't understand why, where they are in the middle between what and what. <laughs> so you can see this is, this is a broad definition of the Middle East, it goes from Morocco to Afghanistan, uh, from east to west, and from Turkey to about Sudan here, from north to south. It is based, this definition is based on religion, culture, uh, geography, way of life. And um, this, uh, this definition uh, is being used all the time, although there is a shorter one were a number of countries uh, from the previous map have been eliminated. So you see Libya is eliminated here. But for us, Libya today is very important. And, uh, and so Turkey and Sudan are here. Here, Pakistan is, is eliminated, also a very problematic country. So I would like to include both Libya and Pakistan in the definition of the Middle East. But this is, uh, this is uh, the shorter version. The first element, the first thing to know about the disintegration of the Middle East today, 
and the whole region is being disintegrating. Uh, we have civil wars in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen for years now. Failed governments all over the place. And uh, this, functional, this functional authority. We have to begin with religion to understand what is happening today. Religion means, in this context, the uh, historical wide divide between Sunni and Shiite Islam. I'm sure that all of you know this division, but I want to show you countries that are Shiite predominantly and Sunni. So this is Iran, Iraq, Shiite. The majority are Shiites. Sunni, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Persian Gulf countries. But this is not enough because Shiites live in other parts of the Middle East. And this is very significant for a number of reasons that I will explain later. So again, you can see Iran and Iran, 90 to 95 percent Shiites, Iraq 65 to 70 percent. Uh, and and uh, the other countries, um, Azerbaijan, beyond the Middle East, uh, Yemen, 35 to 40 percent Shiites. But then Lebanon, 45 to 55, this is, this is actually 55. The last census in Lebanon was taken in 1932. <laughs> because Lebanon is, is really divided among all uh, religious and ethnic minorities who hate each other and from time to time fight each other. So they don't want to descri describe the truth about the real division uh, of, uh, uh, among those ethnic groups. And I need to say many, many Christians left Lebanon from the early 70s. Syria, 50 to 20 percent Shiites, Alawites, and in Kuwait, 20 to 25 Shiites. Bahrain, 65 to 75. This is a majority. And you may recall that, the, that there was an attempt or, uh, of uprising in Bahrain during the first year of the Arab Spring, but Saudi Arabia and the military in Bahrain simply, simply destroyed that uprising. There's a huge American military base here. Qatar, 10%, and Oman, 5 to 10%, Egypt, only 1%. So this is the distribution of the Shiite minorities uh, in the Middle East. And I'll explain a little bit later why is it important. This is a significant uh, um, turning point in Middle Eastern is uh, history. Because many of the countries in the Middle East today uh, emerged after World War I as a result of a questionable agreement between France and Britain exactly 100 years ago. Why? Britain defeated uh, the Ottoman Turkish Empire which ruled the area for hundreds of years. And they sat together, Britain and France sat together, divided the area. They took rulers. They didn't understand anything about the region. One may say that perhaps they still don't understand. But they, they did not consider any tribal, ethnic, religious, and national uh, groups in the region. As a result of it, they divided the area. And you can see uh, this under French influence. Lebanon, incidentally, was taken out of Syria. Syria never recognized Lebanon as an independent country. There were never Syrian ambassadors to Lebanon, and vice versa. Syria has always claimed that the French took out this territory and made it Lebanon because, they, because Lebanon, at that time, was predominantly Christian. And uh, Iraq, Jordan were under British influence. Also, this area uh, of Palestine, the, this British control. So as you can see this map. They divided, divided the countries. And in many ways, this, this division was artificial. And 100 years ago, those perhaps 
uh, artificial entities exploded and are disintegrating. We have a number of what we call in political science failed states. So even before the uh, Arab Spring, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, Somalia, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, failed states. They don't function. And in several of them, as I mentioned, there are severe uh, civil wars. This is Syria, where much of, the, uh, much of the warfare is taking place today. So you can see, says the Alawite. The Alawites are a kind of Shiites. 50%, about 50% of the people of Syria, controlling Syria for almost uh, the beginning of uh, Syria, Syrian independence. The rest are Sunni. So this is Sunni dominated central Syria. Kurdish area up here in northern Syria. Kurds are also northern Iraq, also in Turkey right here, and also in Iran. So this is like Kurdistan, if, if you want. Much of the fighting today is around this city of Aleppo. And here you have a Druze, another religious ethnic group right here. So in this, in this area alone, you can find as several uh, ethnic, religious, and national groups. This is ISIS. Has all kinds of names. I steal uh, Islamic State. Obama likes to call them ISIS because, you know, ISIS is Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. They call themselves the Islamic State. So Obama does not want to recognize their aspiration to establish an Islamic State all over the world. That tells you something about terms like Middle East, Arab Spring, Islamic State. All of those terms have, have a meaning that you either accept or reject. So this is, this is the Islamic State. And uh, the You can see the map? <laughs> oh. Of course you can see it because I'm in front of it. Thank you. Okay. So, this is the area taken by the Islamic State. Uh, part Partly it's Syria, partly it's Iraq. And uh, th that the Islam, the ISIS was able to very quickly take over the, uh, this territory because of, because of the civil wars in Syria and Iraq. The Syrian army was busy fighting a number of rebel groups. And here, the um, Iraqi military simply disappeared at the, at the moment of truth. This was the largest area the Islamic State was able to capture. And um, I don't have to tell you about the atrocities, the crimes against humanity, the, crime, the war crimes of those people running this state. And, um, uh, this, the, the, the Islamic State represented a major threat to other countries in the region, uh, to, to, to Jordan, to Saudi Arabia. They all are Sunnis, but the Islamic State would fight and kill any Muslim that does not accept their brand of Islam. So the, not only they are against Jews and Christians, they are also against many Sunnis. So this, is, this was a major development uh, in the region that we still uh, struggle with. And the Islamic State have all kinds of, uh, all kinds of affiliates, so to speak, around the Middle East. You may not see exactly where, they, but they are in Nigeria, in all kinds of places here. Many of those groups were there anyway. But because of the huge successes of the Islamic State, 
they declared affiliation and loyalty to the organization. And in some places, they use violence. This one is, uh, is important for Israel. There's, there's a group in Sinai that is challenging, uh, for example, the Egyptian military and the Egyptian role. This map represents a loss of territory uh, in the Islamic State uh, rule. So this was taken from them and, uh, in, in, recent, uh, in recent months. They lost about 40% of the territory. But even if the Islamic State disappears tomorrow from the map and all of it will disappear, the idea of the Islamic State will continue because of one reason alone. And that is the, pro the providing of identity and mission. Um, we asked ourselves why so many hundreds, hundreds, even thousands of people from Europe, well educated, have good jobs, good income, go to fight in Syria and Iraq. Why? One of the explanation is that they got from the Islamic State both identity, especially the Muslims in Europe, which are struggling, who are struggling with identity and mission. Be part of a movement that wants to conquer the world and, uh, uh, re uh, and revive the great Islamic empire of previous, um, previous uh, uh, ages. This is Russian, the Russian intervention. This is, this is Iran, this is another story. So the, the issues that I've mentioned to you created uh, new alliances in the region, and I want to speak for a few minutes about those new alliances. So I need to go, to go back to, to the maps that we have at the beginning. Maybe this map would be better. So one, uh, one, one important alliance is, uh, is this? Hmm? Okay. This alliance. It's Iran, Iraq, remember? Two Shiite countries. Syria, which is controlled by a Shia sect. And Lebanon, which is also dominated by, by Shiites. So you see, this is, this is one alliance right here. Uh, Iran is participating in the civil war to protect Bashar al-Assad, the, the uh, ruler of Syria. And they also intervene also in the civil war in Iraq, but mostly here in Syria. And um, why? They are interested in Syria because they want access to uh, Lebanon and because Lebanon has a border with Israel. And Iran declared a total war against Israel. So it's important for Iran to have that access. But Iran is also here in Yemen. I mentioned a civil war in Yemen as well. There is a Shiite group here called Houthis. They, about 45% of, of, the, of the people, they were influenced by the Arab Spring, wanted to remove the government here. So a civil war erupted here between the Sunnis and the Shiites. So they cannot be left by themselves. So Iran is helping the Shiites here. Saudi Arabia is helping the Sunnis here. So you have Iran involved in Iraq, in Syria, and in Lebanon. And Iran is also attempting to, uh, uh, to influence the, to the result here. And look at Yemen. Yemen is a, a significant strategic place. 
If you are here, you can move from here to challenge Saudi Arabia. If you have, if you have a base here, you can, you can challenge Saudi Arabia. You can challenge also the Persian Gulf countries right here. And this is what Iran wants to accomplish in the region. Iran wants to dominate the region and to become uh, the hegemon of the entire area here. And of course, these countries, Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt, uh, are, are uh, afraid, are threatened by Iranians' ambitions. And so we have a counter alliance here. Basically a Sunni alliance, but so, so this alliance includes Saudi Arabia, uh, the Persian Gulf countries here, Egypt, Jordan, and, and uh, those rebels here against the Bashar al-Assad regime. Because Saudi Arabia from the, from the beginning went against the government of Bashar al-Assad here. Why? Because they don't want Iran to dominate Syria. Every, everything is connected to everything else. If you understand the first uh, stone, then it's easier to, uh, to, uh, to understand the rest of them. So, so we have these two basic alliances. One is called the Shiite alliance, right? Second one is the counter alliance, which this is the alliance. And you, you can add Jordan and Egypt, and to a certain extent also Israel. And I'll speak about it a little bit later. So this is the counter alliance. We also have superpowers involvement. So Russia joined this alliance because Russia wants presence in Syria. It has a, a naval port in a city called Latakia. This is the only warm water port uh, Russia has in this part of the world. And they have invested a lot in Syria. They want to protect the government of Bashar al-Assad. The other, the counter alliance is supported by the United States. And um, the United States wants to end the war in Syria and Iraq, stabilize the situation here, and perhaps um, um, restrain the Russian intervention here. So it, it, it collaborates with with Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia in those, in those countries here. You can see Jordan is in a very difficult situation. It's right here. It has a border with Iraq, a border with Syria. There are a lot of refugees coming into Jordan. The biggest city in Jordan today is here. City of refugees, Syrian refugees. Uh, government is strong here, but under threat, Iran, wants to change the government here. The Islamic State wants to take over Jordan as well. So Jordan is in a difficult situation, but is being supported by Egypt, Israel, and Saudi Arabia, so we have a counter-alliance, so to speak. Now, Turkey is here. Uh, Turkey adopted all kinds of policies toward the situation here under Erdogan. Uh, at the beginning, there was uh, some cooperation with the Islamic State. Uh, but recently, uh, Turkey is probably more joining the Western, pro-Western alliance here. It um, fixed the problem with Russia. There was a problem with Russia because Russia wanted to preserve Bashar al-Assad and Turkey wanted him removed, and they also fixed a uh, relation with Israel here. So Turkey is now moving in the direction of, of fighting the Islamic State, as well as uh, the, uh, the terrorists here in, inside Syria. So we see here shifting alliances and geopolitical, all kinds of geopolitical um, transformations. Uh, I need also to say something about the nuclear deal with Iran. Regardless the merits of that deal, there are good things about the deal and bad things about the deal. We would, know, we would not know 
how this deal is going to be historically effective for some years to come, but I can tell you about perceptions of the deal in the Middle East and some consequences of those perceptions. The perception uh, in, in the entire area here, the Arab area here, is that this deal is not going to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear power. And they are looking also at the other things that Iran is doing, and I mentioned the intervention in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen here, and they are quite concerned. And therefore, they are, this is another reason for building the, this alliance here. One reason is the situation in Syria and the Islamic State. The other reason is Iran. And so how you block Iran or, the, or, uh, or reduce the influence of Iran by creating coalitions and alliances. And one interesting alliance that emerged in recently is the one uh, that Israel has developed with Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states here. Why Israel? Because both Israel and those countries are allies of the United States. They have been quite disappointed by the Iran nuclear deal, which the United States led. And therefore, they told themselves, well, we need, Israel is a strong military country. Why shouldn't we do something with Israel? So right now it's under the table, but there is very close cooperation between Israel and, this, uh, and these states. Israel has a peace agreement with Jordan, very close intelligence, strategic, and a military cooperation with Jordan. And obviously, the same applies to Egypt, with which Israel has a peace agreement. Egypt and Israel share a common interest in the Sinai, where a, an Islamic State affiliate is fighting the Egyptian military. I mentioned that el, uh, earlier. There's also uh, both Israel and Egypt are interested in, uh, in uh, reducing and minimizing the influence of Hamas in Gaza. So what you, what you can see here uh, is a plethora of interests, conflicting interests, shifting alliances, geopolitical changes, rapidly changes, and uh, this will continue to be with us for some time to come because, and I think this clearly can be, can be seen in the attempts to achieve a ceasefire, not peace, mind you, just a ceasefire in Syria after 500,000 people killed, about 6 million people's refugees, 2 million people wounded. Syria is now in the uh, Stone Age. They still cannot even hold a two-day ceasefire. Those of you who read the New York Times, don't believe every word there, but there's, a, there's an article President uh, Carter wrote there, and President Carter did many good things and bad things in the Middle East. One of them was uh, the Iranian Revolution, Islamic Revolution of, of 1978-79. This was the first time uh, the Shiites were able to establish a, a Shiite, an independent Shiite state with ramifications until today. But Carter also mediated the Israeli-Egyptian peace agreement. So Carter wrote this morning uh, an article in the New York Times about, about the attempt to achieve um, ceasefire in Syria. And he said, stop the killing. This is his message. Excellent message. But this is what they have been doing for, all, for some time now. And apparently they like it. They enjoy it. Killing each other. Especially Muslims are killing Muslims. By the hundreds of thousands. In many places. So the reasons for the Iranian ambitions and for, this, for the existence of the Islamic State, and for the failed states, and the Arab Spring, all these reasons still exist. 
And as long as they exist, this region will continue uh, to export violence and terrorism uh, in, in the region itself and elsewhere. There's a paradox here with regard to the Islamic State. The more they lose territory, the greater is their motivation to conduct terrorism elsewhere, especially in Europe. And they also use quite effectively the social media. This is quite interesting because they were able to recruit excellent directors, editors, uh, photographers for their videos. So they use 21st, I wrote an article about it, 21st communication technology to go back to the way of life of the sixth century. <laughs> and I have been asked several times, if they are successful, would they allow the internet and the social media to exist in the sixth century way of life? Uh, in conclusion, uh, I want to say, the picture is very complex, very difficult, many dilemmas, very difficult dilemmas. Only, only, and I always envy people who always have a solution. Certain problems don't have a solution. And I've met many people in Washington who have solutions but are looking for the problems. They are trying to define the problems for which they think they have solutions. So I think that, uh, but I think that the focus on the Islamic State is wrong. Because I think that the greater threat to stability of the region and to world peace comes from Iran. And Iran wants nuclear weapons, among other things, to dominate the entire region and to make the whole region uh, Islamic, an Islamic theocracy of the kind that, that they have established. So we have a huge competition here. We have uh, the Islamic State wants to conquer the entire world and establish an Islamic caliphate. And we have Iran, which wants to do the same thing, but Iran wants to make it a Shiite caliphate, and, and uh, the Islamic State wants it to be a Sunni caliphate. So the, the historical fight between Sunnis and Shiites is being reflected here in the Middle East. The Sykes-Picot agreement that artificially divided countries here exists today. Because if you look at Yemen and Libya here, and Iraq here and Syria here, tribes are fighting each other. We are almost in the sixth century. We don't have states. We don't have sovereignty. We don't have governments. Tribes in Libya, several of them are simply fighting each other. There's nobody to organize, to win, and to organize a functional state in that region. So Iran and the Islamic State were exploiting the consequences of, of the Arab Spring, the disintegration of the Arab state system. And I think that this alliance here that uh, has emerged versus the alliance here that has emerged, these two alliances are going to fight each other for some time to come. And I believe that the American role in all of this has been significant and will continue to be significant. It's not easy to leave the Middle East and to go away and let the Middle East uh, kill each other as much as possible. It's not, it's, it's not working. We, we have this saying that if you try to run out of the Middle East, the Middle East runs after you. And um, I think the next president will have a lot of work to do, a lot of thinking to do, uh, the, the, it, no matter whom is going to be the next president. An assessment, an, a reassessment, a real reassessment of the problems, of the forces, of the goals of all the parties here have to be re-evaluated 
And one of the deficiency in the uh, present strategy is the lack of a coherent strategy. So someone has to come up with a strategy, a long-term strategy, not a short-term one, a long-term strategy. Americans, like you, have to decide. Do you want to continue to lead, to, uh, to keep the order, to keep the peace in the world, or not? If you decide not, nobody else will take your role. There's nobody, nobody else, no China. China wants to be a superpower very far from there, and China, China does what is good for China. And Russia is doing only what is good for Putin. You know, we expect the United States to care about, not just about itself, but about other important things in the world. And I hope that after the elections, we will see some changes uh, in American policy. I always criticize those who blame everything in the Middle East about, uh, on the United States and the West. This is too easy. The Middle East is responsible for what is happening in the Middle East. And the Middle East has first and foremost deal with its problems. But the Middle East for many, for, for centuries now, always blamed the West for their problems. And this is again something that has to be changed because the trouble emerges, emerged uh, from here. The solution also exists here. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'll be happy now to take a few questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gilboa, for a very thorough overview of uh, the current situation in the Middle East and especially uh, the interconnecting issues and the shifting alliances. So uh, we're going to move on to the Q&A session now. And I'm going to start with uh, some uh, broader picture questions on the Middle East first and uh, move into Israel a bit later. Um, so the first question I have here is uh, in your talk, you touched uh, a little bit on the, the, Russian, the recent Russian intervention in Syria and also the shifting alliances in the region and uh, with Russia recently playing a more active role in um, in Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East how could you expand uh, expand a little bit more on, on how that's viewed by different nations or different alliances in in the region okay I'll just I'll I'll, I'll uh, give very short answers so I can I can deal with more questions so the Russian motivation in the region uh, um, stems from, and I mentioned that, regional considerations, but there are some others. One of them, one of them is to reduce American power and influence. So if you have a leadership vacuum or a perceived one, vacuum cannot uh, survive in the middle, in anywhere, anywhere for a long period of time. So if somebody gets out, somebody comes in. So Putin wants to damage, hurt American power and influence in the region. Putin has also a big problem uh, in, in Europe, in the Ukraine, the, the intervention in, uh, in Crimea. So what Putin is trying to do is also to confront uh, the EU and the United States over the Ukraine. And now when, when Russia began its military intervention in, the, in Syria, they said they were bombing uh, uh, ISIS. But they were bombing the pro-Western rebels whom the United States support. And they, among other things, this is all around the city of Aleppo, they created, they created with a massive air bombardment, the huge wave of refugees. And Putin could not be more uh, happier to see those huge waves of, of, of uh, refugees coming to Europe from Syria and Iraq. So uh, the, the Russian intervention has been motivated by a number of regional, European, and global 
reasons. Uh, the Obama administration thought that Syria will become the, the second version of Afghanistan. Russia invaded Afghanistan and ruled Afghanistan for 10 years and then were kicked out. Or the Vietnam of the United States. This has not yet happened. And the result that we see thus far is a stronger position for Russia. And by that also, the strengthening of the Iran-sponsored Shiite alliance. And, and some, some countries in the Middle East are thinking, oh, maybe they should join Putin. And Egypt, for example, is, is, a, is a case. Uh, uh, Sisi is not satisfied with the American at attitude and position. And so he's trying to play a game with Putin. So I think this is, this is discouraging, because if you look at Putin and Russia, they are playing only destructive roles in the region. OK, next question. Um, we are receiving a lot of very good questions. Um, despite your conclusion that the Middle East is responsible to what is happening there, what role did the war in U Iraq have on the current situation, the current state of affairs in the Middle East? That's a good question. Yes, it has something to do uh, with what we see today. Uh, because uh, a number of reasons. As I mentioned earlier, in my view, Iran is the biggest threat to regional stability and well-being. And Saddam Hussein was a terrible dictator, but he balanced Iran. The removal of Saddam Hussein created a golden opportunity for Iran to penetrate Iraq. Secondly, what happened uh, in Iraq for a long period of time, the Sunni minority, again, a minority regime, really oppressed, discriminated the Shiites. All comes down to Shiites versus Sunnis. For many years, suddenly there are elections in Iraq. There's a huge problem for the West, uh, which confuse elections with democracy. You have an elected government, you think you have democracy. But this is not the case. Democracy uh, requires civil rights, human rights, separation of powers, independent judiciary, independent media, women's rights, nothing of that exists in the Middle East. And to think back in 2003 that you can, you can have democracy in a place like Iraq, or uh, during the Arab Springs in places like Egypt, this was really far away from what the reality was on the ground. Yes, many, many people want democracy. But first, they want to leave. And what happened in Iraq is uh, daily, deadly acts of terror. So you don't think about terror when you have bombs exploding near your house. And the Shiite government, the new Shiite government, uh, supposed to be a coalition government between the Shiites and the Sunnis, uh, began to oppress the Sunnis. So when the Islamic State rapidly took over territory in Iraq, it was helped by the Sunnis who rebelled against the Shiite government in Iraq. So the United States has some responsibility for what is happening in Iraq. But again, some responsibility, much of the responsibility still lies with, you, have, you, have, you can do so much. And uh, the greater responsibility is with the governments of the area, in this case, the government of Iraq. And a follow-up question to the previous question. From a, a grand strat strategic point of view, the US positions in Iraq and Afghanistan um, somewhat supported the con containment of Iran. What can be done now? Many, many things can be done. Uh, one thing is, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think that the West, not just the United States, but the West in general, 
uh, consider the Islamic State to be the greater threat uh, to the world. And this is uh, perhaps better understood in Europe because of the terrorist attacks there. Uh, but, and they think therefore that whoever fights the Islamic State is on their side. So the problem is that those who fight the Islamic State have other agenda and interests. And therefore, this has to be recognized. The main sources of what is happening should be recognized. For example, I'm not so sure that uh, Iraq could be one state. Not only I'm not sure Iran could be one state, I don't think it's desirable to, be, to, to have one state in Iran, in, in Iraq. Maybe it should be divided. Kurds have won, the Sunnis have won, the Shiites will, ha will have one, so we go back, perhaps, to, to again, to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was a bad, a bad agreement. Can Syria be restored to one geographical unit? There is uh, an assumption in the world that borders are sacred. You don't touch borders. But I think it's wrong. I think given the, uh, the violence and the killing and the hatred in those countries, I think it's about time to think out of the box, as we say, and to look for solutions that uh, perhaps are more realistic. Uh, I don't think that you can have a peace in Syria with Bashar Assad. And you cannot have peace with Syria with the Islamic State. So those forces have to be removed and uh, new structures have to be established. Now, I think that, the, that in international relations, uh, we distinguish among, this is the academic in me that's speaking to you now, we, we have a number of, uh, several types of power. Hard power, like military power, soft power, which is an area I deal with, public diplomacy, this is communication and education and attraction. And we have found that we use now the term smart power. Smart power is the combination of military and soft power. If you use only one of them, you, uh, you uh, give up on a significant instrument of international relations. So I think that one should never say, we're not going to ever use military force, because sometimes this is the only solution. And one cannot say that we are going to use only military force, because this is not a solution. They need a combination of diplomacy, of communication. And I think this uh, fight with ISIS is done primarily through the social media. And I don't see good counter attack on, on the Islamic State. All kinds of reasons. So we need a strategy that would maximize resources, military, intelligence, communication, diplomacy to, uh, to achieve uh, goals that, uh, that um, uh, must be adopted in the region. So speaking of ISIS, this is actually a great segue into the next question, also into um, the topic on Israel. Uh, radical groups like ISIS and also uh, al-Nusra are running operations and waging jihad in very close neighbors of Israel. What has been preventing these groups from attacking Israel? <laughs> they are busy killing each other for the time being. Um, yes, there, is a, uh, there are radical Islamic groups. Um, on the Syrian-Israeli border. If they mess up too much with Israel, then they will suffer tremendously, and they don't want to do that. In the Sinai, I mentioned that there's another group affiliated with the Islamic State, and uh, they, they are, right now, they are deterred of attacking Israel. But I think that, um, as they say, once they take over Syria, the next target is going to be Israel. Israel is aware of it. 
There was an attempt, by the way, which is a, a significant one, by Iran. Iran and Hezbollah. Hezbollah in Lebanon is uh, an Iranian proxy. And they attempted to establish a base in the Golan Heights, in the Syrian Golan Heights, uh, Golan Heights, from which to attack Israel in the future. And this tells you something about the complexities of the Middle East. That, so this is Lebanon. Hezbollah is very powerful here. But Hezbollah is losing its legitimacy inside Lebanon. Because people in Lebanon say, why are you intervening in the Syrian civil war? Why are you building uh, a force of 120,000 missiles to use against Israel? What is, what, what is your business here? The answer is, you are a servant of Iran. You do not care for Lebanese interests. So this is the idea. So Hezbollah in Iran attempted to move to the Syrian border with Israel to establish a base there. So Israel is not stupid and so far has prevented that from happening by brute force, like by military attacks on those attempts. Okay, so uh, the recent 10-year military aid agreement that was reached uh, last Wednesday, I, I believe, uh, has been a very heated topic in the news. And there's also been clearly differing uh, positions on, 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 the, on the subject. What, 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 what's your take? And do you see the pact as uh, a historic achievement or more as a sign of uh, the withering relationship between the US and also Israel? First of all, uh, I think that the use of the term aid is somewhat misleading. You give aid when you do not expect anything in return. In this particular case, the story is different because Israel is returning. Uh, intelligence, uh, development of sophisticated new weapons, uh, such as the Aero Missile Defense System, and uh, Iran, is building intercontinental ballistic missile. One wonders who would be the target of those missiles, especially if you put some nuclear weapons uh, on them. And Iran closely collaborate with North Korea on those issues. So the United States may need those highly sophisticated defense systems. Um, Israel is also cooperated with the United States on military doctrines and weapons experimented with in, in the field, anti-terrorism uh, activities and doctrines. Uh, and uh, be surprised, border security. Israel has huge border problems and is coming with new sophisticated uh, security measures. So if you look at all of those, some people argue that $3.8 billion a year is a good bargain. Uh, much, much of this money is spent in the United States to buy weapons anyway. This is a deal for 10 years. It, I think it strengthened the relations between the United States and Israel. And I want to say something about those relations Many countries in the world, especially American allies, look at the American-Israeli relation as a measure of American reliability and commitment to any ally. And the last few years were not good. And I think this deal, which comes at the end of the Obama term, there were all kinds of debates about it. Would Netanyahu sign this deal with Netanyahu, wait for the next president? And I've written an op-ed article, several op-ed articles suggesting that he make the deal now with Obama, because you never know about the next president. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, and so I think I'm very happy, and I think uh, th this is a good, a good message, a good message, first of all, to the Middle East itself. When the United States is strong, Israel is strong. When Israel is strong, the United States is strong. This is why if uh, the United States wants to lead the world, then these alliances are significant because you cannot do many things on your own and you need allies and you need reliable allies. And so, so and I think this, this um, aid agreement uh, for 10 years now, and many of us think that at the end of that period, 
there would be no need for such uh, military uh, support. For Israel, it's going to be perhaps the last, the, the last time. 10 years because military and strategic planning takes a long time. The present agreement will expire in 2018. But, so this one will cover 2018 to 2028. And it creates uh, a stability uh, in the relations. You don't have to argue again every year what will be given, what not will be given. And it allows the building of force uh, in Israel that then uh, is important for all American allies in the Middle East, given what I've just said about the new alliances that are emerging uh, between other American Arab allies in the region. So on the topic of U.S.-Israel relations, uh, about five years ago, in the midst of the Arab Spring, The Economist ran an article coining uh, the, the U.S.-Israel relationship as a marriage of convenience. It was meant to highlight um, that with the Middle East becoming more democrat uh, democratic, Israel might become a liability in the relationship between the U.S. and um, the, the newly trans transformed countries. Obviously, a lot has changed since then. And given the new reality, in what aspect would you still consider uh, the U.S.-Israel bond a marriage of mutual benefit? And how do you think uh, the, the, the approaches of the two presidential candidates would differ in the new administration? I'm not going to say anything about your presidential elections. Uh, but um, the... Uh, the American-Israeli relations, as I've just explained, uh, had nothing to do with the problems in the Middle East. Because there's a tendency in the, in the region as well to think that uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, is the number one conflict in the region. And if and only it is resolved today, uh, the Middle East will become a paradise. Israel had nothing to do with the Islamic Revolution, 1978-79 in Iran, had nothing to do with the Arab uprisings, nothing to do with the rise of the Islamic State. And it, uh, the resolution of the conflict is important for Israelis and Palestinians, but it is not a major issue in the Middle East. Now, for many years, people have said that because of that close relationship between the United States and Israel, then the United States is being hated in the Middle East. Again, this is not the case. The United States is hated in many quarters of the Middle East for two reasons. One, because Arab leaders, who are even allies of the United States, promote anti-American sentiments among their own public opinion as a way to deflect opposition to them and criticism of them. And secondly, um, and this is also uh, quite interesting, and the second reason is that many groups and movements in the Middle East simply don't like the American and Western way of life. They don't want women's rights. They don't want democratic liberties. And so and, uh, this comes out very clearly in the Islamic State, in Iran, uh, everywhere you, w w the fundamentalists see the United States as the major threat to their own way of life. So these are the reasons. But I also want to tell you that there's a lot of criticism about the United States in the Middle East, and the greatest critics are the first to stay in line to achieve a visa for immigration to the United States. <laughs> Thank you, and in the interest of time, I just have one last question, and sorry I didn't get a chance to get through all of the questions we received tonight, uh, and this is more on the topic of uh, Israel's uh, national politics. In the near term, do you expect uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Likud party to maintain their dominance uh, in Israel politics, or uh, would another party uh, could rise, and would, would, uh, what, which party would it be, and how might their foreign policy be different from the current party? 
Uh, I want to make a distinction here between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his own party. He has been uh, too long in, 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 in power. Uh, I think that we have to have term limits, as you have in the United States. Serving too much uh, in government is not healthy for anybody. Uh, and I think this might be, you know, this might happen in Israel in the future. I think um, right now he, there is not uh, sufficient opposition. There is one centrist party uh, under the leadership of, of a former journalist, a very popular journalist. His name is Lapid. Lapid. I think he's going to be a prime minister of Israel in the, in, the, in the near future. But right now, it seems that Netanyahu is losing support in his own Likud party. So the challenge from another party uh, could be uh, years, uh, years from now, a few years from now, he may have to face a huge challenge from inside his own party because ministers, even ministers in his own government, are not satisfied with his leadership and conduct and behavior. But I think he's going to be prime minister for, for some time now. I know maybe, maybe one year, two years, something like that. And he will face serious challenges. If, if he is removed, then it's going to be from his own party. Right now, there's nobody in the opposition to challenge him. But I think in about a few more years, there are going to be serious challenges also from other parties. Somehow the left has not succeeded in recent Israeli elections because the emphasis today is on security and defense. And somehow the left is considered to be too soft. Uh, I may remind you something about your own party system too soft on foreign affairs and security. Uh, this may not be the case. And unless uh, the labor or, you know, most, most of, Israeli, of the Israeli public is at the center, center right and center, and center um, left. Somehow, you media always pick up the extremes on the left and the right. And this creates some kind of a distortion about the political system. So uh, in the future, I think there's going to be uh, uh, some rotation between center left and center right. And um, leadership is in short, uh, is a short commodity everywhere, uh, especially, especially in, de in democratic countries. I have my own theory about it. I'm trying to get my students to go to politics. And they always ask why, uh, why I want to punish them. <laughs> because in the age, in the information age, you are totally exposed. And if someone will dig, will dig you, something will be found. And the life of politicians and public servants um, has become very difficult to deal with. And I think this is, this is something democracies will have to deal with. Putin does not suffer from any problem like that. And uh, maybe other dictators, but we don't see good leaders and good leadership almost anywhere in the Western world. Thank you again for coming and for listening.